In the previous video, we saw two fairly straightforward ways of solving the reinforcement learning problem, random search and policy gradients. Now, while both of these methods can be very effective, neither of them gives us a particularly deep insight into how the problem of reinforcement learning can actually be solved. The first, random search, treats the whole problem as a black box, and the second applies the total reward for an episode uniformly over the whole of the episode. In either case, do we get any kind of insight into how this credit assignment, how do we actually reason backwards from the total reward over the episode to the individual states? Q-learning is an alternative that can give us a bit more insight. But consequently, it's also a little bit more complex. To start, we'll set up some basic notation. When we enter a state after taking an action A, we get a reward, and this function we call R. The environment also tells us which state follows after we take this action, and we'll call that S prime. And this function that gives us the state transition for taking action A in state S, we'll call that D. We also have our policy, which is either deterministic, in which case we call it the policy pi, which given state S outputs a function A, or it's a probabilistic policy, which we describe as a probability distribution of an action conditioned on the state. The first two functions, R and D, define the environment, and the policy function defines the model that we are learning. So this is how these functions fit to the picture of reinforcement learning that we've been drawing so far. The learner trains the policy pi. After it takes an action, the environment gives us a successor state, S prime, which is shown to the learner together with a reward. To understand the problem that we're actually trying to solve, we need a very, very simple example. And the example we'll use is the robotic Hoover, also used in the first lecture. But we will make the problem so simple that we can write out the policy explicitly. The room will have two states, A and B, and the Hoover can move to the left or to the right. One of the states has dust in it, and once the Hoover finds the dust, it gets a reward, and we reset for the next episode. The robot is always reset to state A, and the dust is replaced in, st in state B, but the robot, of course, keeps its learned experience. So in this setting, what is it that we actually want to optimize? For a given policy, how do we define how good that policy is? If we fix our policy, and we'll stick to deterministic policies for now, then we know what all the future states are going to be, and what rewards we are going to get. And what we will optimize for is what's known as a discounted reward. We sum up all the rewards that we get for a given policy. We know all the future states and all the future rewards. And we sum up all the rewards, but we multiply them with a weight gamma that is exponentiated as we move into the future. So the reward for state zero is not multiplied by anything. The reward for state one is multiplied by gamma, the reward for state 2 is multiplied by gamma squared, the reward for state 3 is multiplied by gamma cubed, and so on. And gamma is usually a value like 0 0.99, something close to 1. The idea here is that we're interested in maximizing the reward over the whole of the future, but we weigh a reward in the future slightly less than an equal reward now. If the reward is the same, we would rather have it sooner than later. And this gives us a value that we want to optimize. Somehow, we want to choose the policy that maximizes this discounted reward. If our problem is finished after a certain state is reached, like a game of chess, then the discounted reward has a finite number of terms. And if the problem can potentially go on forever, like the card pole, the sum has an infinite number of terms. But in that case, the discounting ensures that the sum still converges to a finite value. With this, we can define a value function. So we start with a policy pi, which is a function of a state to an action. And for a particular policy, we define the value of a state as the discounted reward if we apply the policy starting in that state. So if from a particular state, the policy will ensure a high future reward, then that state has a high value. And the value essentially indicates how eager we are to get to this state. If we know that there is a state with a high value nearby, then we should seek it out because we know that from that state, we can achieve a high future reward. The second thing to note is that if we look at the terms of this value function, ignoring the first, that they all have a factor gamma in common. 
And if we factor out the gamma, then the thing that we're multiplying gamma by is actually the value function again, but this time the value of state 1. So we can describe the value function in this recursive way. The value under policy pi of state 0 is the immediate reward that we get for following the policy in state 0, plus gamma times the value under policy pi of state 1. And with this value function in hand, we can define an optimal policy. This is the policy that gives us the highest value function for all states. Note that this is always possible, because if policy A gives us the maximal value in state S but not in state Q, and policy B gives us the maximal value in state Q but not in state S, then we can define a new policy that follows A in state S and B in state Q. And with the optimal policy in hand, we can define V star, which is just the value function for the optimal policy. And using V star, we can rewrite pi star as a recursive definition. The optimal policy pi star is the one that chooses the action which maximizes the future discounted reward, assuming that we follow the optimal policy. So here we have a definition where this notion of optimality occurs both to the left and to the right, in the definition of pi star and in the definition of v star. And if we write out what that means, if we write that out symbolically, we get this function at the bottom here. We sum up the immediate reward from state S. We add to that the future discounted reward from the successor state of S, assuming that we've taken action A. And these two terms we maximize for our choice of A. And that's a new definition of the optimal policy. This may be a bit hard to wrap your head around, but it's a very useful property. We've defined the optimal policy in a way that depends on what the optimal policy is. So that doesn't allow us to compute pi star directly, but it does define it. If someone gives us a policy, we can recognize whether or not it's the optimal policy by checking if this particular equality holds. To make this easier, let's take the part inside the argmax and call it q. So the function q star, which is a function of a state and an action taken in that state, is the sum of the immediate reward plus gamma times the future discounted reward under the optimal policy of the successor state. With this, we can rewrite our definition of pi star by simply filling in this q, but we can also rewrite our definition of v star from the previous slide by maximizing over the action. q is essentially the value of taking action a in state s, so if we maximize over a, we get the optimal policy. And we can fill this definition of v star into the definition of the third line, giving us a definition of q star in terms of q star. So we have a function q of states and actions from which we can derive a policy or a value function. And again, this may be a little difficult to wrap your head around right away, so think of it this way. If we were given a random q function, any function mapping state action pairs to numeric values, how could we tell whether it actually represented this optimal q function, q star. We don't know pi star or v star, the optimal policy or the optimal value function, so we can't use the original definitions. But this equality here must hold true. If we loop over all possible states and actions and plug them into this equality, we must get the same number on both sides. To see how this works, let's try this for a simple example. This is the two-state Hoover problem again. We have states A and B and actions left and right. This means that we can describe the entirety of a particular Q function in a table with four rows. For every combination of the two states A and B and the two actions L and R, we need to describe what the Q function says. And here on the left, we see a particular example of a Q function together with the immediate reward function for this particular problem. So let's say somebody gives us this Q function and we want to check whether this particular Q function happens to be the optimal Q function. We'll take gamma to be 0 0.9, and we'll simply check all four values of the Q function. We start with the first row. On the left side of the equality, we insert the value of QSA, which for the first row of the table is 1. And on the right, we insert the immediate reward, which for the state A and the action left is 0. To that, we add the discounting parameter gamma, 
0 0.9 times this second Q value maximized for A prime. So first we need to know the successor state for state A if we take the action L, which is A, because if we start in state A and we move to the left, we bump into a wall and we stay in state A. And then we need to maximize the Q function for the actions from state A. In this case, we have the options of the actions left and right. Left gives us a Q function of 1, and right gives us a Q function of 2. So the maximum value we can achieve is 2. So in this case, we have a 1 on the left of the equal sign, and 2 times 0 0.9 on the right of the equal sign, which has shown us that the two sides of the equation are not equal, and this particular Q function here cannot be the optimal Q function. So an obvious next question is, if this is not the optimal Q function, is there a way to find it? Given this recurrent definition, can we somehow find a function that satisfies this definition? The principle that we can use is to solve recurrent equations by iteration. Here's a simple example for a scalar function to illustrate the principle. We have a function x equals x squared minus 2, and this is analogous to the definition we had for the Q function. We have one value on the left and one value on the right, and we want to find a single number x so that the value on the left is equal to the value on the right. The only difference here is that we're looking for a single number instead of a whole function. Of course, we all learned in high school how to solve this kind of problem by rewriting. But there is another way, which is by iteration. We start with an arbitrary value. We compute the value on the right-hand side and take that as our next guess for the value x. So let's start with x equals 0. We fill that into the right-hand side, which gives us 0 squared minus 2, which is equal to minus 2. So this becomes our next best guess for value x. So minus 2 is our next best guess for the value of x. We apply the function on the right-hand side to minus 2. So we get minus 2 squared minus 2, which is 4 minus 2, which is 2. We apply this again as our next best guess. So we apply the function on the right-hand side to it. We get 2 squared minus 2 which is equal to 2. And with that, we have found a value for which our recurrent definition holds. This explains the basic principle of solving a recurrent definition, where something is defined in terms of itself, by iteration. And this works for function definitions as well, which gives us the Q-learning algorithm. We start with a function QSA, which is 0 for all of its inputs S and A. We enter a loop in state S, we take some action by some method, whether by our policy or not. We arrive in a new state, S prime, and we receive an immediate reward, R. And with that, we look at our Q function. Now we know that for the optimal Q function, QSA should be equal to the immediate reward plus the discounted reward times QS prime, A prime, maximized over A prime. So we simply compute the value on the right for what we've just observed, and we update our Q function, QSA, so that the value on the left is equal to the value on the right. And note here that when we're computing the value on the right, we are maximizing the value of our successor state S prime over all actions A prime, and we're doing that with the current version of our Q function, which we will then update once we've computed the right-hand side. To illustrate how this works, let's go back to the room with six positions in it. And we'll label them A, B, C, D, E, and F. And to keep things simple, we'll see what happens when the robot explores the trajectory A, B, C, E twice in a row for two episodes. We start in state A, and we initialize our Q function with only zeros. So for every possible state action pair, the function Q, S, A returns zero. We take our first action, which is to move up from A to B. So we take the action U, and we end up in state B. And we observe an immediate reward of zero, because we've not found the dust. So now we can update our Q function. The immediate reward R is zero. Our successor state S prime is B. And if we maximize the function Q for state B over all new actions A, we see that the maximum value we can achieve is zero, so we update our Q function for the state we've just left, A, and the action we've just taken, U, with this new value, which is 0. We take the action R a step to the right, which moves us from state B to state C. We update our Q function again, 
the immediate reward is still zero, we've still not found the dust, and maximizing the Q function for state C over all actions A prime, we still get a value of zero. So our Q function still doesn't change. We move to the right again, and we end up in state E. Now this time, our update to the Q function does have an effect, because we found the dust. The dust is in state E. So we get an immediate reward of one, but this second term, maximizing the Q function for all actions in state E, still gives us a value of zero. So we update the Q function for state C and action R with a value one, that when we're in state C and we take action R, we get a reward of at least one. So at this point we found the dust, so it's the end of the episode, and we reset the world. The robot is reset to state A, and the dust is replaced in state E, but the Q function is retained. So let's see what happens when the robot follows the same path with this Q function. We start again in state A, we take action U, and we end up in state B. Our immediate reward is zero, and in the second term we maximize over all the actions we can take in state B, so we still get zero. In other words, this step still doesn't update our Q function. We take a step to the right and end up in state C, and now we can observe a difference from the previous episode. Our immediate reward is still zero, the dust is not in state C, but the second term of our update requires us to maximize the Q function for state C. If we look at our Q function for state C, we see that we get the value zero for the action up and the value one for the action R. In other words, the maximum value we know we can achieve from state C is one. We multiply that by gamma and update that as the new value of our Q function, which now looks like this. We take a step to the right again and we end up in E, where we observe the immediate reward one and no future reward. So we update our Q function to the value one, which it already had. If we were to repeat the same episode again, then the moment we hit state B, our update becomes non-zero because we know that from B we can hit C, and from C we know that we can guarantee a future discounted reward of at least 0.9. This is how the Q learning algorithm updates our Q function. It explores until it finds a reward state, that immediate reward is recorded, and in the next episode, the reward is propagated to the neighboring states of the reward state, and in the next episode after that, the rewards are propagated back even further, until eventually they reach the start state, and we get a good indication of how we should navigate our state space. Of course, what we've kept fixed here is which actions we should take. In contrast to policy gradients, where the standard approach is to follow your current policy, Q learning completely separates the exploration used to learn the Q function and the exploitation of the Q function once it's been learned. Any policy that has sufficient randomness will converge to the same Q function. In practice, epsilon greedy exploration is a popular choice. We follow our current Q function greedily, except with a certain probability epsilon, we take a random action. And often epsilon is decayed as learning progresses. If we now look at our tic-tac-toe example, our state space can be drawn like this. This is also known as a game tree. From the starting state on the left, we simply enumerate all possible actions we can take, all possible successors the environment can provide, all actions we can reply to with that, and so on. Note that if we have fixed our opponent, then these blue parts won't actually be branches, because the move that our opponent will choose is deterministic. However, since we don't know which move the opponent will choose, it's best to draw the state space like this, so that we can discover through exploration. An episode consists of a single game until either we've won or the opponent has won. And once we've reached that state, we know that the Q value for the action we took to get there and the state we were in when we took it is minus one, in this case, because we've lost. If we then repeat the exact same game, this information propagates to the neighboring states. So if we set the discount factor gamma to one, then the second time we play this game, we learn that this state here also has Q value minus one. And the third time we play this game, this information has propagated back to the start state. Now what we've described so far is called tabular Q learning. 
it explicitly stores Q for all state action pairs, essentially in a big table. This has clear downsides and is really only practical for toy problems like this vacuum cleaner or playing tic-tac-toe. It's only feasible for very small state spaces. And more importantly, there is no generalization between states. What we ultimately want from an intelligent agent, when it enters a state that it's never been in before, is for it to use the similarities to other states that it has seen before to make a good decision. For this, we need to move away from this tabular storage of Q and store Q inside a machine learning model that can generalize. If we use a deep neural network, the resulting algorithm is called deep Q learning. And the interesting thing here is that we can reuse the basic structure of our policy network to give us a Q network. We still have a function from a state to all actions, but this time we use a linear activation and we interpret it as a prediction of the Q value. For a given input S, we take the output for action A to be an estimate of the value QSA. And we can still use the update rule from Q learning, but this time use it as a target for our neural network. We have an output QSA that we observe for our neural network on the left, and we can compute a value on the right that it should be close to. Here's how that might look in the tic-tac-toe example. We play a game, usually by an epsilon greedy approach, following our current policy. And after each move we make, we can observe a reward and compute a target value for our network, which consists of the immediate reward plus the Q value of the successor state maximized over all actions. We add this together, and this is the target value for the output node corresponding to A, the action we took. We can compute the difference between the two, for instance, the mean squared error, and then backpropagate this error to update our Q function. And note one important difference with policy gradients because there we had to keep our intermediate values in memory until we'd observed the total reward for the whole episode. Here, we don't have to wait until the episode is finished. We can immediately do an update after we've made a single move. So that's deep queue learning. Now these slides hopefully give you an overview of the basic mechanisms of deep reinforcement learning. However, if you want to actually use these algorithms to do more than just play tic-tac-toe, you'll need to know a lot more tricks of the trade. Reinforcement learning is one of those methods that requires a lot of experience to make it work well. Our lectures in the master course Deep Learning provide more details on the extra methods you need to use in addition to the base gradient estimators like policy gradients and Q-learning. The OpenAI Spinning Up website contains a lot of information and is specifically geared to people that want to implement these kinds of methods themselves. And finally, OpenAI Jim is a nice resource that saves you the considerable effort of writing an environment yourself. You can just download many different environments and focus on writing a policy network together with a training method. In the next video, we'll look at how all of these methods were combined by a company called DeepMind to create the first AI program capable of playing Go at the top human level.